Nashville, Tennessee, the state capital, the fastest growing city in the U.S. right now, home of hot chicken, right in the heart of the Bible Belt, and we are known for music. Music City, USA. We're not just known for country anymore. Things are so diverse, and it will blow your mind. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Paul V, and I am walking down Music Row in Nashville, Tennessee. I am giving to you studio tours right behind me are some of the classic studios right here in the city. Here at Music Row, we are immersed with music studios such as this one right behind me. Everywhere you go, there is a studio. You can throw a rock and hit a musician or a recording studio here in Nashville. In this series, I'm gonna be taking you to some of the home studios in Nashville. Behind me is a commercial facility. We'll be visiting some of those as well. We might be seeing some big ones, some small ones, maybe some bedroom producers, and some studios in between. And guess what? I might have a celeb or two on the show as well. And if you are ready, let's go. Ladies and gentlemen, the moment we've all been waiting for is finally here. Nashville Studio Tours. I realize that this has been a process, a process of putting this thing together, mostly one of time. What is good, everybody? My name is Paul, but you can call me Paul the Fifth. fifth, fifth. Welcome to my channel, Legacy Studios Nash. The initial idea came to me in January of 2020. Then the next thing I know, the pandemic hit and the world kind of shut down. Going back into last summer, last fall, and earlier this year, I realized that a lot of my friends wanted to do studio upgrades. So this is a season of studio renovations. Today, we are going to meet a man that has been titled the Godfather of Nashville. He has been given this name by a mutual audio engineer friend of ours. His name is Bobby Holland. He works at a studio right up the road from me here at Berry Hill called Penn Tabaret. Now the audio engineer we're going to meet today has done a wide variety of things throughout his career. Let me tell you about some of these awesome events. He's recorded bands at Bonnaroo. He has a nationally recognized podcast to give you tips and tricks to learn more about music production. He has just completed a full world-class renovation to a studio with a complete Pro Tools rig to record bands just like you. And the last thing that I wanna mention is From the Heart. He'll talk about this in the video, but he got a cease and desist letter. He has taken things to our Metro Council and escalated things all the way up to the Tennessee Supreme Court, and he has won this battle. So now, anybody that wants to have a home-based business in the Davidson County Metro Nashville proper area can do so legally. Many thanks for this, sir. Much love and respect for me, as well as many of the audio engineers in the Nashville area. Before we get into the meat and potatoes of the video, let me tell you about a few of the artists that this audio engineer has worked with. Adele, you know her, Ben Harper, Coheed and Cambria, G-Love, Grace Potter, Tori Amos, and none other than the Zac Brown Band. Now this audio engineer has done one other studio tour that I know of. I'm gonna post it somewhere up here so that way you can watch it. You can see the before and after of the complete renovation. It'll blow your mind. Go ahead and pause things. Cool, now that you're back, let's go ahead and get into this. This audio engineer studio is up in East Nashville, Tennessee, and it is called the Toy Box Studio. Yes, that's right. Today, you're gonna meet an exceptional audio engineer with a great ear, awesome guitar player, and amazing human being. His name is Liz Shaw. Liz and I have known each other about two years now. We've kept in touch off and on, and towards the end of May, I was able to attend an event where Liz got his personal album, Kadoosh, mastered at Sterling Sound here in Nashville. Can you tell that I'm getting excited for this? Well, you should be too, because today we're gonna be experiencing the first Nashville studio tour. Okay, let's get into this. Let's get the show on the road, so that way you can meet Mr. Liz Shaw. All right, everyone, here we go.
All right, so we have made it to East Nashville. We are at the Toy Box Studio. I am so excited. Let's go ahead and meet Liz. Well, hi. Hello. <laughs> Liz. Hey, man. How are you, dude? I am good. You threw me off guard. Thank I you did. Oh, well, I, I have a tendency to do that, man. Welcome I love to the studio, dude. Hi, Daisy. Glad to have you here. That's Daisy, the friendly dog right there wandering around. Yes. Come on in. Thank Come on you. in. I was just tuning up my Teletubby here. Okay. Oh, this is the wrong one. Hold on. Let me get the right one. Uh, there you go. I didn't know they talked. Come on in, fellas. Okay. Welcome to the Toy Box Studio. Thank you. The renovation looks amazing. I had never been here before, but I saw the prior video with you and Joe, and I'm astounded. Well, yeah, I was here all you. last weekend too with the mastering, but this is great. Yeah. So you're, of course, referring to the, one of the last times I did a studio tour video was, was with Joe Gilder years yes. back. It looked quite different because I still had, um, you know, the colors were different in here. I didn't quite have the whole room treatment going on, and the um, I still had the MCI console. In there. And you look different. You had a big beard <laughs> and big the beard uh, and hipster. What yeah. they call that? The man bun? I think. Yeah, I'm doing the man bun. That's okay. what you got to do. It's a it's a good trick for covering up your ball spot when you uh, grow your hair out real long. Gotcha. So welcome to the toy box. This Thank you. is uh, the control room. Basically, uh, at this point, it used to I used to have some analog tape in here and an MCI console that was a one of a kind board. But I decided to, after years of mixing and recording into Pro Tools, using a computer to record and then mixing digitally and in the box, I decided it was time to really sort of embrace that method and move into the future and gotcha. so part of that meant setting up a mix area for myself that's really all about you know controlling what's in the computer and mixing as controllers and stuff like that so it's, i got uh, controllers here for mixing in pro tools and then um, got this new desk that's sort of nice and nice workspace so that i can just you know roll up in a chair and uh, and get a nice comfortable position for mixing and then, the, you know, the big specialty. Yeah, the Carl, what's it, Carl Tatz? Is yeah, that how the, you pronounce the name? The Carl okay. Tatz Phantom Focus system is the speaker system that we installed in here. And it involves these two speakers that you see right there. And then there's a pair of subwoofers that are down in the corners down and in they're the sort corners. of out of sight, you know, hidden. And that whole combination gives you a sound when you're at the mix position like this of an a totally accurate sound from 20 hertz all the way up to 20 kilohertz. So that's the extension of human hearing, basically. Yes. You know, as an average of, of human beings. And let me tell you guys, this system <laughs> will blow your mind. I heard things, dimension, it, it's, it's just incredible. If you have the opportunity, you said Carl, is he the one to contact for something like that? Yeah, Carl Tatt's design, he basically had a studio over near um, Centennial Park. In oh, Nashville. he's local. I didn't know that. Yeah, and then he, he was really into the monitoring system, and really he was always adjusting and tweaking it out. And that just led him into a whole world of setting up other people's monitors and studios and then just getting more and more into it until he basically created what's called um, the phantom focus system it's an assembly of elements it's you know it's the speakers it's the speakers, stands it's that subs. but it's also um, the system for installing them in the studio it's also the treatment yeah in the here. treatment of the room in here and then at the end of the process you know laser aligning everything and and putting up a microphone and shooting it all out so that it um you know it's like perfectly balanced and everything so it's, it's pretty cool, and you know, I could I could point to a few things that he did in the studio here if you want. Um, yeah, if you have some time, that'd be yeah, awesome. Yeah, sure. So, I, this used to be I you know I had the shape of the control room here, and I had a few panels up that I put up myself. Um, I think I had something there and there and there, and I had this sort of corner that was just hard. You know, it was wood. It was like um, quarter inch plywood, I, um, and then he came in and we added more treatment and put up this fabric and installed these uh, panels on the top corners that act as base traps. And then these columns here 
um, we actually added the mirrors. Which, I which, love that. Yeah, it's so cool. And, and like when Carl suggested the idea at first, I'm like, I'm like, we're going to put mirrors on the walls. In the you control know? room. Yeah. And it, what was interesting about it is that it really opens up the space and it makes it feel so much bigger and more spacious in here now, which is wonderful. And of course, my first question, I was like, are mirrors going to sound good, you know, in a control room? Well, what was interesting is, you know, he pointed out that it's it they don't sound different than just a hard wall surface right there in those mm -hmm. spots anyway. So it's really like you get this visual aspect. But these and and his design for putting these up and having them sort of cascade along the mirrors is what he calls his acoustic lens system. Okay. And it basically helps focus the sound and direct it from the mixed position to the back of the room. And then again, there's panels there. You get some bass trapping. We added all these beautiful hanging panels to the ceiling. I didn't used to have any ceiling treatment before, and so I was getting echoes all over the place and stuff like that. And then, you know, just retreating these panels in the back, and then the the whole back wall got treatment as well, and it got all kinds of uh, insulation and sound treatment. So that and the couch in the back really adds all this kind of bass trap into the room and helped it out. And it's like night and day difference. I mean, the oh. same room, different speakers, different stands, but same room. And the way it used to sound compared to the way it sounds now is just completely different. I wish I could have been in here before, but I'll say this, guys. Sitting on this couch when we were listening to mixes in here, you can feel the subs. It's yeah. an experience. It's awesome. Yeah, yeah, it's really fun. And, and you know, you... If you enjoy bass music and EDM, you can just crank it up. I'll, I'll listen to dubstep on here if I feel like it, you know, or 808 music. Sweet. But just the classic rock stuff, you know, like pulling up Dark Side of the Moon and just listening to that whole album and being able to turn it way up is really um, fun. And then, you know, more than ever, I'm really aware of, too, the difference between modern productions that I play back and old school stuff and you know where the volume knob ends up like you know the old school stuff wasn't mastered mixed and mastered so loud so you could really crank the speakers up and have more headroom you know and so mm -hmm. it makes it a lot of fun to listen to but that was cool and then we also you know got in these matching low racks for either side so that mm -hmm. we have symmetry you know i immediately filled up the surfaces i knew i would i knew i you know it's like I think the design was meant to be like, oh, nice and open and clean and everything. And you can put your things down. I'm like, nah, man, I'm just going to put mic pre's and synthesizers and everything on there. But, you know, then the racks themselves house Pro Tools and mic preamps and, you know, a handful of different effects units and things like that. And it's fun. It's just, it's, it's really a lot of, oh, and then there's some, this particular some desk Alborg. is an Argosy console. Okay. And it, so I Lovely. have these, you know, racks here that, that allows me to put some more stuff there cool since i wasn't here before i never saw the old mci i have seen one and worked with one when i was a student at the recording workshop they had right. one yeah but how many like inputs did you have on that so that board was a split console oh um so you had uh just a producer desk just literally a flat desk on the left side and in the center was the recording section and it had um, 20 mic preamps in it and then those would go through faders and then they went up to the top of the desk in that center section actually had a touch sensitive um, routing matrix. Okay. So Ooh, you could, in a, in a traditional studio, where it came from, it used to be in Criteria Studios in Miami. Oh, so gosh. that would have been originally set up where that matrix fed the tape machine directly. So if you wanted to go to a certain track of tape, you just pull up a mic pre and you just reach up and you just touch that and it would, the light would come up and it'd be going straight to the tape machine. So very, very cool um, system. And I think, I think they developed that idea, I think it was maybe with Bill Simzik who was recording the Bee Gees and they wanted to be able to, with the touch of a button, quickly flip between tracks when they were comping vocals. So gotcha. they wanted to be able to like patch vocals back and then just go up there and during in the middle of a comp just like touch different words as they went by for comping a vocal together so pretty cool stuff and Sweet. then um so that so you would use the center section typically to record mm -hmm. and then the right side had 24 faders okay for a mix return and, and then each of those whether it was the center section or the right section 
had EQ modules that you could actually pop out and move over to a new location. Okay. So you could have bypass modules there where there was no there was no EQ on the channel, or you could stick an EQ in there, and then you'd have like this cool EQ um, for mixing. Sweet. So pretty cool stuff. And then the, the other thing that was really unique about that console was in the mix section at the very top, every channel had its own expander gate module. Because you didn't have automation yet at that time, and because tape hiss could accumulate and become a bit of a challenge in a mix, I think they decided let's just put gates on every channel so that when there's audio playing, the gate opens up and you've got the sound of the track coming through. But when the audio goes away, the gate closes down and now you have no tape hiss on that, cha on that channel. Very ingenious. Pretty wild. So you went from an analog setup to a full in the box mix setup. Yeah. Can you tell me why you chose the S1 and the SSL console? I kept making records with people and Pro Tools was becoming better and better as a way to record and to mix. The sound of mixing inside Pro Tools was sounding better and better every year. And so it just became more of the, the workflow that everybody expected. Mm -hmm. and, and it became really natural to work on a song, print a mix of something, send it, and then come back later working with a client or just hearing it myself in the car and saying, ah, that's pretty close, but I want to adjust it. And that meant that recallability was key. You know, you had to be Definitely. able to bring a song back up, pick up where you left off, even if it was a month ago that you recorded it. Exactly. And that's just not possible in the analog world very easily. It is possible. It is. Some people have that set up, but not, not with my setup, not with that, you know, the MCI desk. In fact, the MCI desk, which really sounded great for mixing, was so finicky at times that, like, if I spent... 45 minutes working on a mix, I wasn't sure if the bass level was still at the same place I had decided it needed to be 45 minutes ago, you know, so gotcha. yeah, and it just was a little bit challenging, you know. Gotcha, it makes sense. So, so with that in mind, I just um, found myself mixing in Pro Tools and in the computer over and over and over again, and I felt like, you know, the conveniences were great, and then any challenges I had, I just felt compelled to, like, you know, work on my ability to get it to sound better mixing in the box rather than, you know, just make any excuses for it. And, um, and with that in mind, having great controllers for mixing in the computer makes a huge difference to me. You know, it's so much faster. Yes. And I like this setup where you have your outboard gear here. So it still gives you kind of that analog feel on things, but I love that SSL because yeah. when we were here over the weekend, we could actually still do hands-on when it comes to EQ. Yeah, yeah. And that is so much better than trying to do things with a mouse. It really lets you zone in and find things. Yeah, so one so of I the really things, appreciate this. one of the things that's, that's really important about using controllers when you're mixing in the computer or in the Pro Tools, or even if you're just you know using a synth or something like that, is with a mouse, you can do one thing at one time. I like to call it, it's, it's the equivalent of trying to play guitar with a, the tip of a pencil. You know? <laughs> and, and what you really need is you need to be able to use all your fingers, you need to be able to use both hands, you need to mm -hmm. be able to be expressive and stuff. And you know, I, I like to think it's similar with mixing. When you're mixing, if you have faders, you've got solo buttons right at the ready, you can quickly solo different combinations of tracks to hear things. You can grab more than one fader at a time. You could Automation. grab a fader, you could grab an EQ or a compression, adjust it with this hand while you're simultaneously adjusting the fader with this hand and compensating for sound or for level, you know. And so that it just makes it much, much easier to um, quickly create a sound and, and a tone and decide what you think about stuff. Exactly. Instead of having to like do this move, now go over, turn this fader down, now go listen to it, and is that good? Okay, now turn this fader back up, do this move. Now go turn this fader down. It's just like, it gets too slow that way. For sure, and guys, you know, us as audio engineers and mixers and producers, we're artists too. We're working our craft, just doing it in a different way. We might not be strumming a guitar or banging out the drums or laying that low wind down, but we're still being creative. So this gives you all that capability yeah absolutely i would say if you're doing the recording side of this and you're a musician first try really hard to treat the recording aspect in the same way that you approach being a musician and playing an instrument
Mm -hmm. yeah. So talking about being a musician, can we check out the uh, live room? Yeah, let's go. We'll take a look over here. All right, so this is what I call the gallery in here. And this is the, the big room. I think it's, you know, maybe 10 feet this way or something, and, a, and maybe 20 or something like length. And then I think it's about 14 to 16 feet from the top of the snare drum to the ceiling up there, which is great. So okay. drums can speak, you know, especially vertically. You know, you can, get a, you can get a good rock drum sound. And then part of the redesign in here after we did the control room is Carl was like, well, you know, we could do some stuff, something in here too. And he said, let's just put treatment on both of these two um, walls. walls. Yeah, so it ended up doing um, 703 and fabric all along here. And that really tightened up the space, especially around the drums. It really made the drums sound focused. And particularly, I noticed that the, the cymbals all sound much, much smoother now. Yes, yeah, so there's not. Like, harshness is like, you know, really toned down because that can be a challenge with drums and sort of, not quite studio design spaces, you can find that the cymbals can sound pretty harsh sometimes. Yes, these drums sound amazing in here. One thing about this room, I love the balcony. Yeah. It reminds me of the Led Zeppelin session. Uh, when the levee breaks? Yes, when the levee breaks, where they have the two mics coming down. So yeah. this room reminds me of that setup. Check this out, guys. Big Zeppelin fan here. Yeah. Wasn't that, wasn't, that done with the drums in the stairwell or something like that. Even. I, I think so, something yeah. like that. Well, so I had seen another studio that Carl did where they decided they wanted to have a certain, you know, the control room size or shape, and then there was just some storage loft space above the control room, and so they just made the, li the live room be what it is like this, kind of narrow, you know, mm -hmm. this is sort of compressed this way a little bit, but go up and over and so it, it makes the room bigger you know just by having openings into the the loft space above you know so that really helps a lot and it helps you know you can kind of hear if you hit a drum you can kind of hear it kind of go up there and splash back which is pretty cool okay so you're um the the vanguard stereo mic is up there okay i think that's the v44 uh, now that that might be wrong so anyway the Vanguard stereo mic is up there and it makes it really easy for me to just do a stereo room sound um, at the top of the stairs and it Blend sounds, it in. sounds I'm sure great. it sounds yeah. fantastic. Sounds awesome. Blend that in. Sweet. Whether it's drums or, you know, if it's string quartet or something like that, that makes a huge difference because, yeah. you know, strings sound best pretty much when you hear the, the room mics. Exactly. You know, the close mics is not really what you're looking for for a string section. Mm-hmm. One of the things I decided to do in here is my mother was a prolific oil painter. Yes, yeah, she's got was some up. amazing pictures. Yeah, thank you. So when mom passed, I, I filled up a truck full of her paintings and I brought them down. And I thought, you know, I got a lot of wall space in my studio. I got a lot of place to, you know, set it up like a gallery. And, um, and so I hung all kinds of paintings up there. And then there's more paintings upstairs in the loft area. That's where all the nudes are. Yes, <laughs> they are. To inspire you for songwriting ideas. Or if you just get sick of making records and you just want to go chill. No, and then this painting right here, this is a, a guitar player in our band, John Minkoff. It's just a cool, expressive, uh, abstract painting. I, I don't know what it is. I guess it's like, what do you think it looks like? To me, it looks like a guy holding a woman, going down for the kiss. Oh, nice. That's my interpretation of that. Okay. See, here's his, like this, here's his arm, and there she is. So he's going in like, hey, baby. That's, that's better than somebody who just picked up a meteorite that he found in a ditch by the side of the road, and he's wondering what it's all about. <laughs> I love it. One of the things I did when I put up the paintings, I thought it would be fun, I was like, Ooh, why, don't, why don't I make them some additional sound treatment? So I stuffed 703 in the back. Oh, in the back. Paintings. Yeah. <laughs> Very cool. Very ingenious. I don't know if it really does anything, but it seemed to help a little bit. Cool. Uh, but so we'll do, I'll do drums in here. And okay. then I've got, this is a 1920 Steinway, seven foot Steinway B. And it's a beautiful sounding piano. Yes. And it's so amazing. it's a lot of fun to do piano sessions. Um, I had the incredible honor of doing a record for uh, David Rogers. Mm -hmm. who's a, a really, really talented pianist, um, and many others. Um, my brother's 
uh, coming down and making a solo piano record with me. He's up in Brooklyn, so that's kind of fun. I was blown away when I heard this on a recording for the first time. The stuff that comes out of here is just amazing. Thanks. And then, um, yeah, you know, back here. if I'm tracking with a full band or something like that, um, if I'm playing guitar, I probably set up this world as my guitar world. And then I just run a cable over here and it can go through the wall. And then I've got an ISO booth here that allows me to set up guitar amps and just kind of have them isolated, close the door and isolate it from the drums if I want and that sort of thing. And then there's Daisy sleeping in the corner. <laughs> Studio dog. <laughs> And um, also the Leslie cabinet is down here and I, I can have the uh, Hammond organ upstairs plugged into that. So that makes it real convenient. And then uh, got to have an antique pump organ from the late 1800s, of course, in your studio. Yeah. And that thing's a lot of fun. It doesn't get tons of use. It's not quite in 440. Okay. So you got to retune your track just a little bit or record this and then retune that. Um, and then, you know, you can take your, your uh, dad's old chest of drawers and turn it into a mic locker, because why not? Oh, cool. I didn't know that's what was in there. Sweet. Yeah. Awesome. And then, um, yeah, and then, then there's an upstairs as well um, with the loft that allows me to have some guitar amps and things like that and keyboards up there. And then real quick, right here, we've got 24 inputs, I guess. Yeah, then okay. the mic panels. Um, try and set it up where, you know, one of the things that was really important to me was to have a studio, I want to be able to easily put up a microphone, get a microphone running from anywhere. I wanted to never have to think about power. You just mm -hmm. turn around and there's a power just outlet right psh, there. Psh, psh. And there's still not enough. You know, you're still like trying to figure out like, ah, am I going to plug this thing in? And then I want to have all the cables readily accessible, headphones, things like that. It's just really important to me that, it, that the workflow in a session is super fast, super exactly. easy to do. Um, you don't have to, you know, look too hard for stuff. Exactly. And in today's age, time is money. It's precious. Both of those. Everybody's working really hard. You're working hard. And you got to have people come in and knock it out. Yep. Yep. And you got to know where to find stuff, too. So, you know, one of the things we did more recently, too, as part of this redesign, too, is originally I thought it was going to be really clever to use pegboard and then you just put those little hangers and i was like oh we'll mm -hmm. just hang stuff up on that not a great idea those things come to pieces really quickly they break really easily okay so finally we just took um these you know wooden two by four kind of things screwed a hole in it put a good you know garage hanger on there and now it's rock solid and, and it's that's great for hanging up cables and stuff like that so i recommend that for anybody who's putting their studio together and then you got to hang your guitars on the walls wherever exactly, you can. Exactly, for sure. You know? Is there anything cool upstairs? Yeah, you we can go upstairs off? if you want. <laughs> we can go upstairs and take a look here. I'll show you what's up here. I think this is the only studio with a kick-ass spiral staircase like this. Spiral staircases of America. Stuff that's cool. So, so some of the stuff this is fun. We got Rolando, the keyboard, the Roland uh, EP9. This thing's fun. That came out of a, um, a guitar shop in Cookville. Then there's a Roland string machine down there as well. Um, fun to plug those into amps. Just some random things, you know. We got the old Yamaha four track still. Nice. When Record player. Yep. Yeah. Turntable. All right, so up here we got, you know, I have guitar amps up here, but I've also got a few keyboards and stuff. This guy's pretty fun. This was the... Uh, the Lowry Symphonic Holiday Family Fun Organ. And this was actually in the Goodwill down the street for 150 bucks back when I first bought the house and started my studio. And it's just full of cool sounds, you know. I... It even has a bend in it where you can bend a note. with your foot. Different sounds and then it's got like a drum machine in it and stuff so you can dial up some beats. Um, so that's pretty fun. That's got great sounds in it. And then over here we've got the uh, the Optagon which um, I've shown off in some other tour videos too. But this basically has these cool records that you slide in 
Does this one have the record in here? I think I'm, I scooted it out. No, I've got it. Great. So let me show you. So these are optical soundtracks on film that go into this guy and they have loops on them. And let me pull this one out because this one's really cool. This is the rock and rhythm. So you slide that in and then fire it up. Thing's pretty fun, right? And then um, we've got the Hammond organ over here too, to the M101 if you want to come on in close. Um, and then this guy basically has a big giant cable that goes down to the Leslie cabinet downstairs with the spinning speaker and everything. So it's got sounds here. I can't fire this one up as quickly. It takes a minute to warm up, but this thing sounds awesome and it's pretty fun. And then you got to have some more Fisher Price stuff like this. And a xylophone right there. The story with the xylophone, of course, is my kid was playing percussion in the school band and needed a xylophone, so I got her a xylophone. And then as soon as she stopped playing, I was like, I get it now, and it goes down to the studio because that's the way it goes. Okay, so this is my favorite piece of gear that Lish has in the entire studio, just for the fact that it takes me back to my childhood. But the S1 is impressive. So I was wondering if you can give us the condensed version of how you went to Metro and the Tennessee Supreme Court to get everything legalized for us here in Davidson County. Yeah, that sounds good. So when I um, was doing my home studio thing, I'd actually been doing that uh, happily making records for 10 years or something like that down here in, in, in my studio right in, the back, in my backyard. In 2015, I finished doing a mix for somebody and I went up to the mailbox and I had a cease and desist letter. And that's when I learned that Nashville, uh, Davidson County, Music City, didn't actually allow anybody to be able to work from home and have a customer come to their house, right? You know, I don't think any, most people didn't really know that. You know, Nashville has a long tradition of people doing home studios and everything, that's what I had seen. That's what I decided that I wanted to do. And I had pursued that. Um, so it was a real slap in the face and a shock for to discover that I wasn't even allowed to do that, right? What you love, yeah. Yeah, so that that really spooked me at first, and then I started thinking, wait a minute, you know, this is this is bullshit. I want to be able to work from home, and I got a right to be able to work from home, and and so does everybody else. So I started a long process of pushing back against the city and saying, hey, I want to be able to defend my right to do this. And um, in that process, I ended up teaming up with the Institute for Justice, which is a, a pro bono nonprofit law firm that's national, and the Beacon Center of Tennessee, which is the same thing right here in Nashville. And both of them specialize in economic liberties and property rights. Hi, Daisy. Hi. Um, and defending people's rights to be able to, you know, make an honest living for themselves and do things like be able to work from home. So that took me through a seven year journey of uh, going to the set of city council and trying to rezone my property where it, it became zoned for both residents and working from home. And then when that failed, we took it to the next step and we filed a lawsuit against the city saying, hey, you guys can't do this. You, you know, it's not, um, it's against my constitutional right in the, the Tennessee constitution to be able to just work from home and make a, make a living, right? And so we were going through the courts there. We lost in the local court. We took it to the appellate court. We lost in the appellate court. And then we took it up to the um, Supreme Court level for the state of Tennessee. That. Yeah, that's amazing. It was really amazing, you know, really exciting process. And then simultaneously in 2020, all of a sudden at the Metro Council level, one of the council members had put forward this new um, home business bill 
saying, hey, let's, let's make it possible for people to be able to work from home and have a customer come to their house. And so when I saw that, I thought, this is what we've been waiting for. The last time anything even remotely like this made an appearance was, you know, t a decade ago or something. So mm -hmm. um, I got to take the opportunity it's and get behind time. it and really make this new bill get through the Metro Council, get passed. And so that's what 2020 was for me, um, was a good seven months of um, raising awareness around this bill to legalize home studios in Nashville and to legalize all home businesses and allow people to have a chance to work from home. Um, that involved things like starting a petition where I got people to add their names and signatures just to support it. And I remember I... I remember signing that. Yeah, and, and a thank you. And I remember putting the thing together and hitting the, the send button on a Sunday night and I went to go have dinner with my daughter and I came and then I checked after dinner and it was like, whoa, we already had a hundred signatures like an hour later. I was like, this thing's kind of taken off. And fast forward to the end of seven months and I was in front of the Metro Council you know, telling them, you know, you guys wanted to hear whether people support this. Well, you know, I plunked down a giant stack of paper and I was like, here's, you know, thousands of comments from people that are right here in Nashville. And we have 160,000 signatures on this petition from people saying, you know, go ahead and pass this law and legalize home studios in Music City. So that was pretty amazing. And we finally did it and, uh, and got that passed. And then I was able to get my my permit for my home studio here and have my first legal sessions right right here in Music City. And, um, and then on top of that, our Supreme Court case is still going mm -hmm. because there's still like, you know, a few more little details that we need to uh, square away so that, you know, we get equal treatment as, as home studios to other businesses mm -hmm. um, in Nashville. So pretty exciting times. Yes. Well, that's where we first met was at SAE. That's my um, alumni. And uh, my alma mater, rather, and um, Liz was there doing an event with Vance Powell talking yeah. about this whole thing. That's where we met, and I was like, I got to get to know Liz. This is an amazing thing that he's doing for me and everybody else. So thank you so much for that. My we pleasure, all dude. Thanks for love signing the and petition. appreciate that. One last question. How did this become known as the Toy Box Studio? I've never known that story. Okay, well, it's a pretty good studio, or pretty good story, rather. Um, and it's a good studio. Yes, it um, is. Top thank you. Uh, so when I was up in the house, I was doing a record with a band called The Autumn Defense. And that's a couple of the members, John Sturrett and um, Pat Sansone. These guys are both in the band Wilco. And um, Pat, when I was working with him, uh, he looked around my studio and he saw all this stuff like, you know, Teletubbies and toys and Fisher Price stuff. Because I used to be in the habit. I was like, you know, every time I'd... I'd get up and start my day and I'd go get a coffee and I'd take my coffee and I'd go swing by the, the thrift store and I'd be like, if there's any musical toy, I'm buying it, you know, for mm -hmm. a dollar, five dollars, whatever it was. So I started collecting all these musical toys and he had the suggestion, he was like, dude, you got to call this the Toy Box Studio. So there thank you, Pat Sansone. Thanks for the, the inspiration and the name and um, called it the Toy Box and it's stuck and it's been that way ever since. Turns out there are some other toy boxes around the world, so. I've seen that, but. But mine is thetoyboxstudio.com, so if you want right. to check this it out, the website. That's right, this is the only the toy box. That's right, it's the only the toy box. Yeah. And you've seen it first here with me, Paul the Fifth. That's my stage name, if you right didn't on, know. Right on, right on. Of Legacy Studio, so this has been a combination of that, so thank you so much. Yeah, dude, thank you, man. In. I appreciate your hospitality this coming. weekend. Take some Thanks time out of your day tour. and showing us. Yeah. Real quick, if anybody wants to get a hold of you for a session, how can they do that? Uh, go to thetoyboxstudio.com, and then my email is just lij, L-I-J, at thetoyboxstudio.com. That email will come to me right here at the studio. And um, I also host a podcast called yes. Recording Studio Rockstars, and it's you know nearly a 1,000 hours of interviews with producers and engineers about making records in studios. So if you're curious about making music yourself in your studio, go check it out. I promise you'll find an interview you, you did. That's right, you will. And you'll have the coolest, most awesome studio dog, Daisy, that was just right here. That's Daisy the dog. That's right.